everyone. Welcome to the uh, Right Like an Expert series. Today we're talking about uh, the Warden School of Business, uh, which is near and dear to my heart because I, I am an alum um, of the Warden School 2004, so very proud of that. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. If, if you can't, uh, definitely uh, shoot us a note and, and let us know. Um, I'm going to get started today with Warden just rolled out a new website. I don't know if folks have had an opportunity to take a look, um, but let us know what you think about it. Um, I certainly have my own opinions. Uh, I think it's a, a pretty nice uh, redesign and, and does some very interesting things with uh, different uh, students and alumni. But we'd love to hear from you. So definitely take a, a look uh, on facebook.com slash admin advantage and uh, we'd love to hear from you. All right, a little bit about Admin Advantage. So we are an admissions consulting company. Um, we've been around now for um, too many years, I guess, uh, over, over uh, six years um, in the business. And um, there are a number of folks out there who, uh, who kind of work with students through the process. And one of the, one of the things that we pride ourselves on are kind of the, these three tenants here. Um, you know, having the experience, obviously having done this for a long time, having uh, deep relationships with um, with admissions directors, um, staff, and folks in the in the industry generally, um, and also having you know have teams of us who have, you know either worked in admissions or certainly worked um, you know with students through the process. All of our consultants have experience, have been through, been in your shoes, gone through top ten uh, MBA programs. I think the other thing that's really important for us is that um, we align our consultant. Um, behavior through compensation um, with respect to paying them a third of their compensation based on your success, so whether or not you get into school, and also how you rate them at the end of the application process. We also have a very structured process for the admissions piece, right? So one, learning about you, uh, helping you build your brand, outlining your applications, and then obviously helping you with the blocking and tackling of the essays recommenders, resume, uh, non-essay portion of the application, and all of the things involved with the application process. And at the end of the day, it really boils down to performance. Over 90% of our clients that have used our packages in the past and we've been doing this for a while uh, have been accepted into at least one school, and this is a subset of the schools um, that they have been accepted into. A little bit about our team. Um, Kofi tends to be the more popular guy um, because he is on the boards quite a bit. He is uh, a co-founder with me, and uh, we went to business school together and, and developed a, a friendship there. And you know, from that that engagement at Wharton, uh, we started the company and uh, have been working on it uh, ever since. So he has experience uh, in both the entrepreneurship side as well as kind of the technology side. Uh, he has a, a Harvard undergrad, Harvard Ed degree, uh, and was very focused in, in entrepreneurship while he was at Warden. Um, you know, we both kind of sold companies both prior to, or well, coping prior to and after business school, and myself prior to business school. Uh, we both worked at Accenture, interestingly enough. Uh, we didn't know each other. But um, you know, we both have an entrepreneurial spirit and and, um, and have a lot of fun together um, trying to build up the company. My background was actually in chemical engineering of all things at Brown, and and, um, and then obviously um, we went to Warden where I was on the admissions committee, and that's when I really first got um, exposed to this this area of admissions, and uh, really started to build a passion around that. In terms of our consultants. Very similar type backgrounds, um, you know, experience all around the board. So, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, McKinsey or um, uh, Google or GE or Goldman, um, experience all around the board. And obviously, you know, as I mentioned to you before, um, have experience at, at top global business programs. Uh, to the right there is actually a snapshot of our consultants. So we're pretty proud of our consultant site. We have kind of a, a formal picture, if you will, and a, a fun picture for each of our consultants. So you can get on, uh, take a look, and see what their skill set is, what their background is, and, and how you can match up. So definitely take a look at our consulting team at adminadvantage.com. Um, you can uh, hit the drop down and take a look at, uh, at some of our consultants. 
In terms of uh, what we offer before we get into um, specifically talking about Wharton, we offer free consultations for people who are interested in potentially using our services. Um, so you can go to skedge.me slash admin advantage um, and, um, and sign up for some time with either myself or Kofi or someone else on our staff. Um, and we're offering a 15% discount. I know it said 10%, um, but uh, Kofi got the best of me. So 15% uh, discount on admin advantage services to the end of the month. Uh, using discount code 5015. So if you are interested, um, I would definitely um, take advantage of that. Also, if you fan us by next week, uh, we're going to be giving away as part of this um, overall Beat the GMAT promotion a final review package for the Wharton School where we will review your application, provide you feedback, uh, structured comments around what can be improved on your essays and your application package in general. Um, and I will be conducting that somehow. I got the, uh, the short straw on that one. But uh, in all honesty, I'm really excited about uh, being able to provide uh, one of those free final review packages for you. All you have to do is fan us on Facebook. Again, facebook.com slash advantage. All right, so getting into the business at hand in terms of um, Warden and what it's all about and, and also the actual application. So. I wanted to take some time to jump into the school itself because I think that everyone who's on this call, whether you're applying to Warden or any other top school, um, you really need to understand what that school brings to the table and how that school is a good fit for you. So when I think about Warden, some people will say quantitative, I say analytical rigor. Um, there's a little bit of a difference there, but I think generally Wharton is and has done a relatively effective job of changing perceptions of, oh, it's just a, a, a quant school, it's just a finance school. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Their main focus is around analytical rigor. So they, they don't want to train uh, future business leaders into thinking that you can just make decisions on a whim based on your gut. So they want you to make informed decisions based on data whenever possible. They don't want that to hinder your decision making, but they definitely want you to seek um, analytical rigor prior to making decisions. Entrepreneurship is a big focus for uh, Wharton. Um, maybe probably one of, the, uh, one of the unsung areas of strength of Wharton, and certainly Kofi and I have direct uh, experience with that. Uh, a global network, so 92,000 strong. Uh, about 35%, I believe, of the, uh, of the incoming class um, was uh, international, representing 64 countries. So it's an amazing global network. As an example, um, when we went to India, I think a, a year or so ago, um, you know, we reached out to a couple of alums, some of whom we knew and some of whom we didn't. And frankly, it just got an, an incredibly overwhelming response um, from alums who said, hey, it's great, love to meet you. Um, we actually had someone who kind of invited us into their home and, and uh, very nice home, by the way. Um, so it's just one of those things that, you know, once you're a warden um, graduate, you're, you're a warden alum for life and it's a very tight-knit group. Diversity, I mean, they're, they're, you know, definitely looking to make sure that each class is very diverse. 40% women, as I mentioned, you know, just over a third international. And, and it's diversity, not just in ethnicity or gender, um, you know, it's, um, you know, sexual preference, it's general background. Um, it's all different types of diversity, not just kind of traditional, um, you know, components of diversity that people might think of. Student run. I mean, if you think about the school, the entire school is basically student run in terms of extracurricular activities. So if you're not the kind of person that loves to jump in, loves to get engaged, and loves to, um, you know, kind of, you know, take the bull by the horns in terms of extracurriculars, this may not be a good fit for you. Um, but if you are that kind of person, it's definitely the kind of place that you want to be because you know, you're going to run your own conferences. You're going to come in and you know start your own clubs and certainly maintain your own clubs. So those are the kinds of things that a uh, warden is looking for in your background. Uh, experiential learning. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, but you know warden's philosophy on learning is one that of uh, experience being a, a key role in, in terms of learning about yourself and about others. Um, and so they really do try to push hard to, um, to show that um, you can learn through experience. So that's definitely one of the things that, uh, that they focus on. And ultimately, 
you know, Warden is all about knowledge for action. And what does that mean? It means taking kind of all of these amazing resources that they have, both you know, in terms of number of professors and number of people in, in large global network, and taking action as a result of that. So um, that is going to be the theme that you'll see kind of throughout this uh, presentation in terms of what Warden is all about. In terms of academic approach, um, diverse teaching methods. So, you know, thinking about uh, teaching through the eyes of kind of lecture, uh, case, as well as experiential learning as we talked about. So, you know, that experiential learning could be something inside the classroom, it could be something outside the classroom, uh, it could be um, doing simulations uh, in the classroom, which is also kind of a method of experiential learning. Um, flexible curriculum. So the curriculum changed in 2012. There's some flexibility in the core. You can kind of shape your own path. I mean, they really wanted to change the curriculum to align it more with you know, giving folks the ability to kind of create their own structure um, and really pursue their passions. And, and I think they've done that effectively. And the feedback uh, from the students has been very strong in that regard. Um, the research centers, so they have over 20 research centers. Um, you know, ranging things from, you know, customer analytics to entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities for professors to pursue their passion and to find students who are also looking in those same areas of passion and for you to continue to uh, continue your, your learning, uh, both inside the classroom and, and, you know, directly with professors. Um, but those areas, that, for instance, we are actually looking to leverage one of those research centers a professor of mine who I worked with while I was at Wharton um, to help us with a particular challenge that we're looking at right now uh, where he is just really the expert in terms of this kind of one analytical area and he has a team of people who kind of work with him on that and that's a way for us as an alum to be able to go back and leverage um, you know the Wharton expertise and so uh, so we're really excited about being able to do that. Uh, next, the 15 interdisciplinary programs. So I've kind of listed some of the uh, more prominent ones, more popular ones here. The Lauder program is amazing. Uh, I have, you know, had exposure to a number of Lauder students. They're all infinitely smarter than I am. Uh, but that is kind of the in international business foreign language uh, combination there. So you come in with one of, I think, nine languages. If you have proficiency in that, then you do kind of a master's. Um, and, and arts in that area, as well as kind of really immersing yourself in international business. So if that's your interest, they have, you know, maybe the best program in the world uh, with regard to that. Um, a JD MBA, more of a traditional uh, three-year program opportunity. They have an incredible healthcare uh, management program. In my old life, I had a focus in healthcare and, you know, the alumni base there, you know, not only on the East Coast, but also on the West Coast and, and throughout the world is very, very strong. Um, they have a SAIS program. Uh, I always miss, um, misspeak it, so I think it's SICE, and uh, I say SICE, so tomato, tomato. But it's um, an international uh, studies program with Johns Hopkins um, right outside of uh, Baltimore. So you do kind of a mixed bag of uh, both MBA as well as kind of your master's program. And then they have a Warden Kennedy uh, government uh, interdisciplinary program as well. From a global perspective, they have these GMC courses, these kind of, you know, uh, week-long or so courses um, where they're very focused and they actually take you to uh, different countries and there's kind of learning uh, opportunities and exposure. A global immersion program, a similar type concept, uh, global consulting practicum where you're working on particular problems internationally and they have various exchange programs. So if there's a place in the world uh, generally that you want to go, uh, Warden has certainly a number of other programs to, to be able to uh, to, uh, to carry those out. The three pillars. So the, the dean at Warden has kind of these three pillars, which I'll run through quickly. Um, you know, the first is global and then social impact and innovation. And some of you may say social impact, you know, you don't think of Warden as kind of focusing on social impact. Certainly global innovation probably are not foreign to you in terms of, your, of the representation of Warden. But, um, from a perspective of global, they're looking at, you know, again, building a diverse class, experiential learning with some of the things that I just mentioned, those international exchanges. And so as you're thinking about it from an application perspective, knowing that Warden is all about these three things, think about global in terms of 
highlighting your global experience. If you've you know spent your entire life in Delhi um, and you've never you know really left the country or some, or the city, um, you may say I don't have anything global. But have you been working with with clients in the U.S. or clients in Europe um, or clients in other parts of Asia or Africa? So really think through your background and think about your clients, uh, where you've uh, been located different language exposure you may have, have different cultural exposures, and try to infuse that in your application. From a social perspective, you know, it's really just a matter of Warden wants to build leaders that want to be a force for good in the world, okay? Um, it's not good enough to um, just be a global business leader um, and make a ton of money. Certainly, um, that's something that I think Warden has kind of been known for is just it's all about just going out historically and, and just going out and, and being successful, whether it's finance or whatever. That was always the stigma with Wharton. And I think that over you know, the last 20 years, they've done a really good job of kind of moving away from that. Um, and you know, the dean is very focused on making sure that social impact, um, whether it's you as a business leader or CEO, thinking about how your business impacts the environment or how you can do uh, better and make social change in and around where you work, um, those are all things that, you know, is now being fused into the curriculum and a definite focus for Wharton. So as you can think about ways that you may have done that in your background, that certainly would be um, helpful for you in terms of your profile. Finally, innovation. So knowledge at Wharton is, is very innovative in terms of just researching a number of the latest uh, business ideas and, um, and, and um, you know, different theories in business in general. There's a lifelong learning component uh, every seven years being able to come back to work and take courses and things like that. There's quite a bit of, of research with a research center on innovation management. So being able to demonstrate your, your focus on innovation, your intellectual curiosity for constantly wanting to learn is really important um, for the admissions process because it's in line with the kind of three pillars uh, that work stands on. All right. Uh, these next two slides are going to be about dispelling some myths, and it's important for you to, to understand this because it, it puts into context what Warden's all about and will really help you through the admissions process as well. So the first myth is Warden is for quants only. Um, there is a foundation in rigor and analytics, as I mentioned to you before. You know, there's, there's a focus on making sure that you make informative decisions based on as much data as you can acquire, but it's not a quant school. Um, there are various learning methods that are really focused around building a very solid perspective of looking at business ideas, both from a case method, experiential lecture, um, and interaction with your classmates. Um, there's a focus on executive coaching and feedback, and also the leadership ventures to really push people away from thinking, oh, this is a very technical school, and to, hey, this is actually a very broad general management school, and it's important to get that broad-based feedback about not only what your technical skills are, are you the best banker, are you the best entrepreneur, are you the smartest guy, but also, you know, what are my management skills? What are the things that I need to work on? What are the, the quote-unquote soft skills that I need to, to work on to be a better manager and a better leader? And then finally, the flexible curriculum really encourages that kind of self-directed path that's important uh, to build a good general management background. The next myth. Uh, Wharton is this extremely competitive place. I don't want any parts of it because if I go there, uh, you know, they're going to they're going to just be so challenging and it's not going to be fun. Well, I would actually say the most competitive part about Wharton is getting in. Um, it is a competitive process, you know, um, twenty percent uh, acceptance rate or even less at times. Um, it's really tough to get in. But at the same time, you know, once you become part of the Warden family, as I mentioned to you before, um, with the example when, when we went to India, people want to uh, connect with you, they want to help you out, uh, they want you to be successful. So that all starts at Warden with the first year when you come in with your learning team, um, you focus on teamwork, you're really paired with, you know, four to six people, four to five other people on your team, who you probably wouldn't have, in the mo for the most part, uh, chosen to be in your team. So these are people from you know all over the world, uh, totally different backgrounds, and you know you never you've never met them before. You kind of meet them all at this uh, at this event at the beginning of the year during preterm. So that kind of begins the process of thinking about teamwork, and you know that you have to work with that team um, as dysfunctional as you may be 
which is um, rarely the case, but certainly does happen at times. Teams tend to run pretty well um, because people know that, hey, I have to work with you for the entire year. But that allows you to begin this focus on teamwork, this focus on, hey, I need to figure out a way to get things done and to make sure that I'm building a relationship with my team. Also, it's a student-run campus, as I mentioned before, so collaboration is key, involvement is key. And the last piece is, is really around this whole uh, interview process, right? So the fact that they made the change, when I uh, spoke to Ankar a couple of weeks ago and, and talked about the interview process, and one of the reasons they put it in is because the importance of fit at work. It's not just about the numbers. It's not just about you know, what you've done, where you work, what your GPA is, or what your marks are and your university, it's about the people who are going to come and be good teammates, good classmates, who are going to be good stewards of the brand. So that's really important, and, and that carries over into uh, a strong alumni base. Another myth, Philadelphia won't be any fun. Who cares about Philadelphia? Not that great of a city. Would I rather be in New York or San Francisco or Tokyo or London? Um, the one thing I will tell you is that it was surprisingly a fun city to be around. I mean, there's great parks, um, there's incredible culture and history, um, you know, U.S. history in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a very livable city, so a lot of the students live together in kind of a few block radius downtown. Um, they've started to move some of the events that they have downtown. Uh, Huntsman is uptown, so in the morning there's this you know, huge rush of people who are, you know, walking up to, uh, to go to Huntsman because it's a relatively short walk or on, on rainy days, um, you know, maybe taking a cab or the bus. So, um, so there are events both at Huntsman Hall and downtown now. Um, there's incredible restaurants. It's close in New York. It's a short train ride from New York and D.C. And uh, at the end of the day, if you really don't like it, uh, there's a ton of global exchange programs. You can go to San Francisco for a semester, uh, whatever the case may be. And then the last myth that's important to dispel about uh, Warden is that I'm not a banker, I'm not a consultant, so Warden's not the place for me. Well, um, first of all, you know, most business schools, approximately half of the people who apply have some sort of consulting or finance background. Warden's no different. That being said, about a quarter of the focus is on entrepreneurship. For people who are, you know, who have been asked what would they like to do uh, post business school, about a quarter of those who um, came into this last class said entrepreneurship. Um, the resources there include the Small Business Development Center, the Employee and Residence, um, and the Venture Initiation Program, of which uh, Kofi was a part of. Um, the other thing that's surprising, the Technology Club on Warren's campus is the largest club on campus. Um, so during a semester in San Francisco at Warden West, um, you could do that, and obviously uh, that would put you a little bit closer to kind of the technology hub of the U.S., uh, it will put you closer to you know, some of the venture capital money out there in Silicon Valley. So that's certainly something that you can do as well. Uh, the program focused on social impact. Uh, clearly, they're listening to the customers who are, who are out there. There's a lot more CSR focus right now, um, and Warden is, is following suit with that and, and knowing that um, that is a really important part of you know, what this generation is focused on, which is fantastic. Uh, and then finally, I think the healthcare program is, is one of, if not the best, MBA programs in the world. And I think the marketing program at, at Wharton is um, vastly underrated. Certainly Kellogg deserves um, all of the, uh, the promotion that, that it gets in terms of its marketing program. But uh, I certainly would uh, consider Wharton to be one of the best as well. So that's a little bit about generally uh, the school and how to think about the school. And now I'd love to dive into the actual application itself and figure out, now that you know a little bit about the school, you know how you want to think about positioning yourself, um, let's start digging into the actual application itself. Before you start the application, one of the things that we do with all of our clients is we focus them on building their own brand. Um, so think of yourself as a marketing person if you're not already. Um, and the key to a successful kind of application process is thinking about yourself as a brand. What are the three to five character traits that you possess, supported by specific examples in your background, uh, whether it's your professional background, your community experiences, or you know, personal um, you know, challenges that you've had to overcome over the years that speak to who you are uh, as a business leader? 
So, you know, in my case, I was a cancer survivor, so I talked about perseverance. I was an entrepreneur, so I talked about innovation. I talked about, you know, the fact that I get along well with people and how I was able to bring people together. Uh, my analytical skills that I built as a consultant. So those are all kind of, I had different stories around those. Those are all the, the key character traits that I wanted to drill home before I even looked at an application. Okay, and it's really important for you to do that because you don't want the application to drive what you say. You want your brand to drive what you say, and you want to be able to fit it into the context of the application questions. It's also important to differentiate yourself. Differentiation doesn't mean being someone different. Differentiation doesn't mean, well, actually it does, but it doesn't mean being someone different than you. It means, it means, it means bringing out the best in that you have, and that's kind of the natural differentiator. Don't read on the blogs and say, okay, this person just got in round one, and they have this background. Therefore, if I have that background, if I say that I do these things well, then I'll get in as well. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so be true to yourself. Highlight your passions and interests and the things that you've done well, and don't rely on the numbers. Okay, and, you know, if you got a, an 800 GMAT, that doesn't mean you're getting in. As an admissions committee member at Warden, trust me, I have recommended more than my share of 780, 760, 800 GMAS to say this is this is a denial for me because of something that I saw in the rest of the application. Um, at the same time, if you have a set a 620 or a 650, and you know you have a really great background, uh, I'm not saying you stop there. If you can take it over, certainly that would help you. But don't think that just because you have that, if you've done the best you can do and that's all that you can do, then you should still think about applying if the rest of your application uh, supports that. Finally, sell the dream. So paint a clear picture in terms of who you want to be, why you want to be there, bridge that gap, and we're going to talk to that in a bit, um, and then use your best judgment on word count. So many people will come back and say, hey, I have a really good essay, but it's 750 words, and they said 500. Word doesn't count the words, um, but they're going to look at it, and when you read enough applications, you read you know, 100 applications a week or what have you, you know when an application essay is long. And so if you think that you can write 750, but the other people are only supposed to write 500, well, that says something about who you are. And um, it's somewhat disrespectful for the admissions committee member because if everyone thought that way, then it would completely change um, their evaluation process. So uh, use your best judgment when thinking about word count. All right, so essay number one. What do you aspire to achieve personally and professionally through the Wharton MBA? So, you know, most of you probably see this as a, a relatively upfront question. It is kind of a short-term, long-term goal, and it incorporates the why Wharton into that as well. Um, going back to what I, what I just said in terms of the, the important thing here is really to paint a clear picture for who you are. I certainly understand, they certainly understand that you may not be exactly sure what you want to do. Okay, and they also know, and you also know, that you may get to business school and it's going to open up a whole new world of things that you've never thought about before and you may change. Here's the great thing. They don't audit you. <laughs> they don't go back and say, oh, wait a minute, Eric, you're running a, a, a leading admissions company and you didn't say that you were going to do that in your application. Now, I, I don't remember what I said in my application, but I'm almost positive that I talked about entrepreneurship and what I wanted to do um, with respect to entrepreneurship, but I may not have said I want to do admissions. And the point is they don't care, right? They want to have a story that makes sense based on your background, based on your passions, based on your interests. Um, and you're able to kind of bridge that gap from what you've done historically to where you want to be. Um, think about, especially as a career changer, are there relevant carryovers, things that you've done in the past that will make you um, potentially more successful in the future? For instance, if you maybe work in a different industry, but you've done kind of similar things to what you want to do. Um, if you have adjacent activities, maybe you've been involved in a community environment where you've done some finance, but your current job is, is marketing and you want to go into finance, you can talk about, well, I have experience in finance and that's where I, I um, found the passion and interest in finance and that's why I want to do that. So, you know, saying, hey, you know, I work in, um, you know, in the automotive industry, I'm a mechanical engineer, 
and I want to go into marketing, um, broadly, you know, statement without any type of support, that's tough to swallow. But saying, hey, I'm a mechanical engineer, I work at uh, BMW, and um, one of the things that I've gotten exposure to in my most recent experience is launching, you know, the mini product. And, you know, a lot of what we had to do was not only uh, go through the technical specs, but talk about how those technical specs really impacted the market, how, you know, the size, the speed, um, the look of the actual technology was going to be perceived in the market. And so it's the first time that I was exposed to marketing, and that's how I got excited about marketing. So, again, that's a way for you to bridge something, you know, seemingly so far apart as mechanical engineering, uh, automotive design into marketing and being able to kind of bridge that gap from the past to the future. That being said, this is not an opportunity for you to go ahead and, and provide your resume a second time. Um, this is really an opportunity for you to focus on the future, but bringing in relevant kind of history, providing context for you to be able to tell an effective story about what you want to do professionally and personally is important. Um, you need to be able to focus on why business school helps you achieve the goals. So, um, you know, how is business school going to kind of um, you know, provide you with the skills you need to be successful at what you want to do. Specifically, how does Wharton help you achieve this? Um, this should not be an essay, I call it a lift essay, um, but this shouldn't be an essay that you just pull from Haas, or you just pull from Harvard, or you pull from Stanford, or whatever. Um, this should be an essay that is completely integrated specifically for Wharton, when you're bringing in some of the things that we talked about early on in terms of, um, you know, the, the components of Wharton that make it different, that make it unique, um, that, that draw you to the school, generally speaking. And then the last thing, and a really important part, is don't forget the personal achievements. Um, the personal achievements can speak a lot about who you are as a person and what you value. Um, there will be people who just talk about professional aspirations, and that can be okay. But being able to speak to what you want to achieve long term, both personally and professionally, I think is a more complete answer. And it also gives the admissions committee a bit more insight into who you are as a person. Essay number two. Academic engagement is an important element of the Warden experience. How do you see yourself contributing to the learning community at Warden? Well, Hopefully, I've been able to help you a little bit in terms of doing some of the research on Warden, but you need to do the research yourself in terms of understanding exactly what Warden is all about and why it's a good fit for you. Focus on your brand and think through, okay, these are the things that I want to bring to the table. How can you speak to those particular components of, of who you are and what you know and how that can, can, um, can, can contribute to the overall learning environment at Warden? Uh, there are lots of ways to contribute. You can contribute expertise. Let's say you have some functional expertise in, in finance, you have some industry expertise, um, you know, in energy or, you know, uh, nonprofit or whatever the case may be. You can bring initiative. Um, and let's say you want to start a club. You've identified a club that you want to start or one that you want to expand or make changes to. And then you can also bring kind of some social impact. Uh, let's say you're kind of You've done, um, you know, a lot of real estate investment in the past, and you know that, um, you know, through your work in real estate, you saw a lot of opportunities in the Philadelphia area, and you want to, um, you know, bring bring together kind of your real estate experience, knowing that there's some real estate opportunities in Philadelphia, and maybe you want to do something in that um, realm once you get to school. Um, think broadly inside and outside the classroom. You know, there are certainly contributions that you can make inside the classroom. That's kind of the traditional focus when you think about academics. Um, but also think about outside the classroom, as I just mentioned. Are the things you can do in the Philadelphia community, are the things you can do in the general Warden community um, that can add value to, um, you know, the community in general. The research centers are a fantastic way to engage academically. So take a look at the research centers. See if you can find um, particular areas that uh, Warden is focusing on that you have a particular interest in. That may be another way to incorporate that into this essay. 
Um, and it should be consistent with your historical contributions and your career path. So um, speaking to the things that you've done historically, if you've never done community service in your life and you say, well, you know, I want to um, engage academically in the community um, and I also want to, you know, help with the um, broader uh, learning community at Wharton by uh, contributing, you know, outside of the classroom and volunteering in addition to kind of my academic achievements. Well, you know, what, what gives them any comfort that you'll actually do that because you've actually never done it before? So just make sure it's consistent uh, with the things that you've done, either your skill sets or, um, or the actual time that you've spent. The optional essay. So this is kind of your typical, um, you know, are there other things that uh, we should be talking about? Um, certainly this is kind of a plug essay if you have certain gaps in your application. We tend to get a lot of questions around this, so I'm happy to take um, some of those questions when we get done here in a couple of minutes. Um, but I would say proactively address areas of the brand that you weren't able to address. Um, so if you have a particular hole, if you have a particular weakness that you need to address, this is a great place to do it. Um, huge gaps in work experience. I say huge, what does that mean? People are probably going to ask. You know, a couple of months, you know, two, you know, if you're kind of at a one to two months, that's probably not a big deal. If you start to push three plus months, that starts to be a bigger deal in, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so non-traditional recommenders for all of you entrepreneurs out there or for you uh, folks that can't use your boss, your direct boss, as a recommender, um, this is for you. An opportunity for you to explain why you're using a particular recommender. Uh, keep it relatively short. Just give an explanation. You don't need to give, uh, you don't need to use all 250 words. In fact, uh, you know, I would say 75% of these optional essays should be far, far less than that, say less than 100 words. Um, just, you know, say what you need to say. Um, you don't need to apologize. Just speak the truth. Talk about what you've done potentially to address a gap and then just keep moving. Um, so that's the optional essay for reapplicants. Um, very similar. You're really addressing the optional essay question, but you're you're uh, you're putting a twist on it. The question really is focused on what you've done differently from your previous application. I, I cited some commonalities here in terms of improved test scores, additional work experience, you know, additional impact that you made, you know, both in the community and, and at work. Uh, maybe you have a new renewed career focus. Last time your application was very broad about what you wanted to do. You spent some more time thinking through that. Uh, or you've had kind of additional social impact that you want to, uh, to talk about. Um, the important thing here is self-awareness. Have you really addressed your previous deficiencies? If you haven't, then you know, that's an indication that you frankly shouldn't apply. Um, it's really important if you're a reapplicant and you can't address these points, then that means you're probably not ready to actually uh, go through the process. Um, the interview process, which I think was a lot of anxiety for folks last year, certainly our customers, um, but I think that waned over you know the, the course of the year when people realized it's not that bad. Um, there, first of all, just breaking down what it is. So there's an on-campus opportunity. There's also uh, an opportunity to interview in, in select cities globally. Um, there's a team-based component to it. So you're spending, you know, 30, 45 minutes um, with a team of five to six other applicants. You focus on a real-world business scenario, business problem, um, and you're trying to uh, figure out or come to some type of consensus. You can also come, come, uh, come out of that discussion with some type of, of next step document, a presentation document that you might have otherwise presented. Um, it is not a, a situation where they can only take a certain number of people in the room. They could potentially take all of you um, and offer all of you um, admission. They could take none of you. They could take some of you. So, um, you know, one of the, the challenges that people had last year was they were thinking, well, my group wasn't that great, so, you know, I'm in trouble kind of thing. That's not the way it works. Um, what I would say, though, is a couple of tips. One, use real-world examples. So again, if you think about what Warden's all about in terms of analytical rigor, uh, being able to say a statement backed by things that you've seen in your uh, experience is frankly what happens in the classroom, right? I mean, you know, when I was in school, if I said a blanket statement and didn't have some type of perspective to back it up, you know, I could get, 
you know, cut up. People would challenge you, and that's what I loved about school was that, you know, you learn very quickly. You know, it, it's not like some other schools where you can just kind of, um, you know, say stuff, and if it sounds smart, people will all kind of nod their head. Um, there's definitely kind of a um, an understanding that you know if you're going to say something that you know it can certainly be an opinion based on you know just what you think and um, that's okay but if if you're going to kind of make an argument it, it should really be based on something um, so and and then you know to the extent that you can work on on tangible outcomes I think one of the most important things related to the interview process is be aware of your tendencies if you tend to dominate conversations be aware of that okay and really try to be disciplined let other people talk um, you know a lot of times for people who are dominant um, I, I will tell them hey why don't you think of, of kind of letting other people get started first and you'll kind of be chomping at the bit but it'll allow the conversation to get started and the people who um, who tend to not be as aggressive might actually feel more comfortable because they've already gotten started and by the time you really get going a nice rapport has already been built among the two. So just be aware of that. And if you're someone who's a little more shy, don't be afraid to kind of say, hey, you know what, do you mind if I get things started? I tend to, to kind of lay back a little bit or you don't have to, to, to tell them that. But just saying, hey, do you mind if I get started? If you're generally a soft-spoken person, people will get the fact that, hey, you know, maybe he or she started things off and, um, and, and they may not jump in right away, but they certainly have a good opinion. There are multiple interviews for law and healthcare. Um, and then there is a one-on-one -on -one interview opportunity, kind of your traditional interview uh, after the, uh, the team-based discussion. So happy to take some questions on that. And we've now reached the end of the presentation, and we're going to, to take some general questions in the GoToWebinar session, so feel free to post those, and we'll start uh, answering those shortly. Um, after this discussion at, uh, at 4 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Pacific time, um, go to the Beat the GMAT chat party. Kofi is there. He is waiting for your questions. He's really excited about answering them, and, um, and, he, and he'd love to kind of serve as a resource there. Uh, take a look at the Warden website. There's a lot of resources there for you. I think it's a really good uh, website, um, and we'd love to hear from you in terms of what you think about it. So post on our Facebook page and let us know. Um, you can find us on Facebook um, in order to, to be eligible for that free Warden application review. I get a ton of people who say, is there anything that you guys give away? Well, guess what? We're giving something away. So if you sign up, fan us on Facebook, um, facebook.com slash Advantage, you will be eligible for the, uh, the Warden application review, and it's going to be only a, really uh, just over a week, eight days, we're going to have that open. So I think your chance of winning it are pretty good. So, uh, so definitely take advantage of that. Um, the school review is available on our blog. So take a look at that. Um, it's kind of an outline with some, some formal tips as well. Um, and if you want a free evaluation, you just want us to take a look at your profile, go to the Beat the GMAT Ask the Expert page for Ask Admin Advantage. And if you're interested in potentially working with us, you can sign up for a free consultation at sketch.me slash admin advantage, and uh, we can go from there. Don't forget to leverage our 15% Beat the GMAT discount uh, using discount code 5015 at checkout. So I will leave that there um, and we will get started um, answering your questions. All right, so um, I'm going to start with the questions. First of all, let me let me thank um, Be the G Man and the Right Like an Expert series. Um, they've been extremely kind hosts, and, and really appreciate them for inviting Admin Advantage to uh, to participate today. And I look forward to kind of addressing some of the questions. Um, one question here, is it okay to refer to entrepreneurial failures in the resume or should that be deferred to the essays, keeping the resume only to cite personal professional achievements? You know, it's a good question. I, I think generally it's, um, I would keep it positive on the resume and I think, you know, you can speak to the learnings um, that you gathered from an entrepreneurial experience in the actual essays. 
and just speaking the resume, it should really be you know more factual stuff. This is what we accomplished. This is what we did. This was my role, and this is what happened. So I think it's a good question, and um, and and you should generally just keep it more positive. Um, for the optional essay, how can you ensure you're addressing weaknesses without making it sound like you're making excuses? Also a good question. I think the answer to that is really this. Um, there's the problem statement or the issue statement of, hey, I, um, I you know, have a weak GPA. Um, and then there's the addressing point. So my point would be keep, keep the actual problem kind of statement to a minimum. Like, so if you're spending a lot of time talking about what the actual problem was or what the weakness was, then that means you're probably making excuses. But if you're saying, I, you know, have a low GPA because, um, you know, during school I, um, I had a lot of personal challenges um, and, you know, just really didn't focus like I should have. That is a problem statement, not an excuse, really, right? You're explaining it, but you're not making excuses. Something that would be more on the excuse side would say, you know, I really had some troubles, and then, you know, sophomore year, things didn't go as well as I thought. And in junior, I thought I was going to do better, but like, that's a long, drawn-out explanation of what happened. That's not really what's important, okay? If you have something that actually happened, like I had a family member die, I worked 30 hours a week to pay for school, state that, and that's fine. And again, that shouldn't take you very long, a sentence or two to say, I didn't have a good GMAT, I worked 35 hours a week because I had to pay my way through college. Okay, now the problem statement is clear. Now, talk about what you've done to address that. Uh, I've taken a couple of alternative uh, courses in school. As you can see, I received three A's, and I really feel like um, the performance that I've shown both my work and the course I've taken since school are more indicative uh, the type of, uh, of academic performance I would expect that would. All right. Another question, do you recommend going on campus for interviews or does it not matter? So, you know, if you're in the U.S. and you're relatively close I, I, and you can make it out, I definitely think you should try to go on campus. And there's a couple reasons, and by the way, this is for really any school, um, but the real reasons are you get a sense for what the school is all about. As much information as Warden and, and, and all the other schools put online in terms of videos and profiles, et cetera, it's really tough sometimes to get a feel for the school until you walk on campus. Um, you, there's, there's a lot of things that you get on campus that you won't get until you get on campus. You'll get a sense for the people. You go in and you, you go to the bagel shop and you go to the coffee shop and you just talk to students. Hey, you know, what are you doing? Um, first of all, you see if people are willing to take time to chat with you. Um, you get a sense for kind of what they're doing. You get, uh, you get their own opinions about the school and what they like about it and what they don't. So I just think setting that kind of tone for you really puts it all in perspective. And sometimes that can be the aha moment that really helps you drive home an exceptional interview versus just having one that's good but not great. Understanding that not everyone is going to be able to make it on campus. My point is that if you can make it on campus, um, you want to do this right, you want to do this the first time, you don't want to have to reapply. So my personal opinion is if you can kind of um, take the time to do that and fit into your schedule that you should do it on campus. Keep the questions coming. These are great questions. Um, what is the normal work experience? Um, so, you know, normal work experience, the median is going to be somewhere between four and six years. Um, they do earlier than that and they do later than that, but that's generally what you're going to see in terms of work experience. I hope that was the question that you were um, asking. It wasn't how much do you work. Um, how important is GPA when it comes to the warden admissions process? You know, it's one of many factors. Um, it's one of many factors. Uh, you know, every year you're going to have someone with, you know, when you look at the range, a pretty low GPA, um, but your median is generally going to be pretty strong in terms of, you know, 3.5 and up. So, you know, that's generally where you're going to see a lot of folks. Obviously, they're going to look at strength of your major, strength of your school, things like that. So um, don't be discouraged if you have a low GPA. They understand that you know, a lot of times, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about kind of 17 to 20, 21-year-olds who are going through school. You may not uh, be as focused as you are now. 
Um, and you just need to take the appropriate actions, whether it's an alternative transcript or really crushing your GMAT or whatever the case may be, to prove to them that that is not indicative of, of who you are and how you're going to perform once you get to business school. Um, does one does one's chances go down if you're an older applicant? I guess, frankly, yes. Um, you know, and 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 I'll caveat it with, you know, certainly there are older applicants who get into war, you know, in their their 30s, early even to mid 30s. Um, but here's why it becomes more challenging. It becomes more challenging because it's harder for you to gain placement out of business school when you're an older candidate especially if you're going to more traditional types of career opportunities like banking, like finance in general, like consulting. However, if you have a specific skill set that would make that not being as much of an issue, that's going to give you a much better chance to be admitted. Um, so when you're an older candidate, some of the important things that you need to think about are what is my kind of career strategy and do I really need you know, the MBA career services, if you will, to place me somewhere? Or do I think my particular set of skills will allow me to be, you know, um, in a really great position coming out of school? Um, am I being sponsored by someone? Am I moving into entrepreneurship? Areas where you don't necessarily need to be placed, because frankly, they're looking at that as, one, they want to make sure that people are a good fit. Right. So if everyone else is called, you know, 26, 27, you know, there is diversity, some younger, some older, but if you're a huge outlier, the question is, are you going to fit? Then the next question is, are they going to be able to place you? Because no one wants to bring you into an environment where you're not going to be successful subsequent to the academic environment. So those are the things that you want to think about in advance and try to get ahead of those potential questions when you're shaping your application. What are some of the best ways to collect Wharton school specific information to highlight on the essays? Uh, well, one is kind of listening to um, this presentation and hopefully you were able to gather some of that there. We also on our blog um, have specific information about the schools, um, but just going on on the website. I mean, you could take a couple of hours, uh, you know, call it three hours for each school and you could get, you know, 75 to 85% of what you need um, for that particular application in the course of a couple of hours. So, you know, what I, what I tend to do when I have tasks like that is I'll kind of use that as my tired time. So, you know, these days I work until, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock because it's application season. But, you know, if I want to sit down on a, a weekend and, and, you know, have coffee and, and, you know, my kids are, you know, playing outside or something like that, I might take my laptop outside. And that'll kind of be some of that time that I might use to do some of that research. Think through what the school is all about. Is this a good fit? So there, um, there's no real easy way to do it. Uh, I think you really need to do your own research. But I would say start there on the websites and, and certainly talk to alums and others who have been through the programs. Um, I mentioned that Wharton is not a quant-only school. Does Wharton prefer people with strong quantitative backgrounds or, or GMAT scores? Um, so it's not a quant school, but they are looking for people who can perform well in an environment where analytics are important. So you, they are looking for people who have shown the ability to perform in a quantitative setting. That doesn't mean if you're kind of an English major and you know, you, uh, let's say we're in advertising or something like that, that, you know, the word is going to be a challenge for you. In fact, I really believe that, you know, as, as a potential business leader, that you should challenge yourself to actually go in a direction that um, is maybe an area that you're not as comfortable. And I'll give you an example. I challenge a lot of times my quantitative people, my engineers, my quant jocks in, you know, hedge funds and what have you, to think about, hey, maybe you should look at HBS, uh, or maybe you should look at in another environment where um, you're not necessarily using your quant skills all the time, and you have to think differently. Um, and I tell my folks who have kind of a, a non-analytical or non-quantitative background that they should look at, at schools where that is valued a little bit more, like a Wharton or a Columbia or other schools. So, um, you know, I think it's important for you to build a, a strength in, in all those different areas as, as a really complete business leader. But, um, 
but um, you definitely want to uh, make sure that you know you have some demonstrated analytical skills. So let's say you're in marketing, just being able to have your recommender support you and say, hey, this person's really good at analyzing data. They've done a lot of work for me in that regard. That doesn't mean you're a quant jock. That just means that you're very good at analyzing things, and that's the skill set that's important for business school. So if you don't have that particular um, quantitative background, you can take some courses if you have time, but you can also really highlight those types of things in your resume and also have your recommenders highlight. All right, more questions. What's the process for a free uh, Warden application review? So we're going to choose someone who liked us on Facebook over the next week to, uh, to, um, to have the free Warden application review. So we will post that um, on, our, uh, on our site, on our Facebook site, and also I'll probably try to send it to, uh, to Beat the GMAT as well so they can uh, let folks know um, who was able to, to get that. All right, let's see. I think we have time for a few more. And again, if you have other questions that aren't answered today, I think this may be the last one or two, Go to the Beat the GMAT chat party um, in the Wharton uh, world. Kofi is there waiting for you. He's excited. Uh, I haven't chatted with him, but I'm sure he's um, eager and ready. Um, with respect to reapplicants, should we change our essays completely as the questions are more or less the same, or can we use uh, the same examples and instances again? Also, the recommendations can certainly be much bigger than that has happened last year. It was already covered in the additional reapplicant essay. Um, you know, it's a really good question. So. I think generally speaking, um, you know, if, if everything's kind of the same, you don't want to use exactly the same application essays. You want to look at them, be very critical of them. Were they specific enough? Do they speak to why Warden is important for me? Um, do they speak to why I'm a good fit for Warden? So I would say first and foremost, you should be critical about it. But at the same time, I don't think you need to feel the obligation to change it, uh, to change them significantly. If you kind of are a recent reapplicant, you are kind of answering the question of what kinds of things have you done differently. So you can certainly bring those types of things in terms of what those differences are out in that reapplicant essay, um, and you don't have to significantly overhaul um, any of the other essays. So hopefully that's helpful for you as well. Um, I think right now, looking at the time, that we're probably going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for participating. Again, I'd like to thank Beat the GMAT for allowing us to host. I really hope that you all got something out of this, and I hope to see you all as uh, Warden alums in the very near future. And with that, I'll turn it back to Beat the GMAT.